I have a very important announcement and welcome to the stage. Five of the teachers who were here to found this school. Robin Jakeline. T.C. Waits. Me. <laughs> Doris Conrath, where are you? And the wizard behind it all, John Kettler. <laughs> Press release for immediate release, dated August 31st, 2011. That's yesterday. Y'all heard of the Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts in Washington, D.C.? The Kennedy Center Alliance for Arts Education Network names the recipients of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts National Schools of Distinction in Arts Education Award for the 2010-2011 year. It's us. <laughs> Back when our sophomores were two <laughs> and our seniors were just getting ready to go to kindergarten, John Kettler was at Tacoma, uh, Tacoma Stadium High School and came up with the crazy idea, this is 98, I think, um, came up with the crazy idea to start this school. He put together a team of people over the next three years and when our sophomores were in kindergarten, we opened this school 10 years ago with us and a few other people at the table. Most of those people are at other, other schools or they've retired and we have succeeded by bringing in the best of the best of teachers over the years and all of them and all of them and all of you deserve this award. A few words from the wizard himself. So thank you very much. I mean, it really isn't true what Paul said. I mean, we started this, but it, this is a group effort. And who really deserves this? So obviously, it's all of you, but it really is all of the teachers. I think it's pretty special that there are five people that are standing up here that started it. One of the people that should be standing here with us is Ralph Harrison, who's at Sammy, so he's there. Two people who would be with us, but they retired are Sonny and Steve Cairns, and they're in China. So of the 10 that were here initially, eight of them would still be standing here on the stage or completed kind of the journey or are working to complete wherever that journey will end. So, but it really is, I think the great thing about what has happened with the School of the Arts is it's really, something that is collective. It's about a whole, it's about all of us working together. It's about building a community. It's not about any one department, any one person, any one thing. It is about how can we continue to get better, understanding that we've never arrived. We trusted that everybody at the table really cared about students, really cared about learning, and then how you work it out from there Actually, it may, it's difficult, but it's not the most difficult part. Even when we differed, we, we respected each other enough to, to work at it uh, and, and make, and, uh, and try to build something together. The English thinker John Ruskin put it this way. He said, each civilization writes its history in three books. The book of its words, the book of its deeds, and the book of its art. He went on to say, you, you can't read one book without the other, and yet, of the three, the only one you can trust is the book of its arts. And that's because it's in the arts where any civilization reveals its true heart, its true center.
think all of us who've talked for any length of time have great ideas about how changes could be made in education. And, and we'd go to people like our principals and they'd pat us on the head and say, well, that's very nice now. Go back to your classroom and go away. Don't, you know, great idea, never mind. So while I was at Stadium High School, I mean, the reality is the stadium still is a mile, mile and a half away from the museums that were downtown. And so to be able to realistically go there or to see the artwork or to involve students in that process, it was just very cumbersome. You'd have to get a bus, the cost, and so consequently it just didn't happen. So that's why really it was to just put a school in the community and have students moving through it so you could, you could access the resources that we have. So it's really instead of isolating education to particular pieces of real estate that don't have any relationship, to the city or to the, you know, to what students are learning is put it in situations where they have access to that. Don't put them in one building, but let them move and be in multiple buildings and then share our resources with the community, but also share the resources, you know, use the resources the community has. If you want, I think if you want to really make something a reality is you do have to write it down. And that way you have something you can hand people, they can read it, and then you quite honestly never know where it's going to go. So. I might hand it to you, but I have no idea the connections that you have and who you might pass it off to. So that was the first step, was to really write down the idea, the concept, what the purpose of it would be, why it would be valuable. And then it was to garner a number of community members that obviously felt the same way. So it didn't take too long, and I had the directors and different people that were head of the museums and worked at the University of Washington, different places that were around the table and saw a great need for it or something that would be, could be a great asset for the city of Tacoma and for the school district. And so slowly that just kind of burgeoned into, you know, a group and a committee and, and opportunity to start the school. I think when I really started to put the document together and kind of formulate the concept was probably around 1998. So that's when I really wrote it down and then started to form kind of the group of people and that obviously just took time. Uh, John actually having the entrepreneurial gene that he has uh, not only had the idea but he want, he went around to all the cultural leaders in Tacoma and so that's where when the Gates Foundation came in so they called us um, it was the summer of um, 2000 and said we'd like to talk to you or no actually they called the first time and said could you send us some information and so we said, sure, we would. I don't know, they called me like a week later or something like that and just asked if we'd just come up and talk to them. So we went up there and talked to them. At the time, there were only three individuals. It was uh, Tom Vander Ark, Kyle Miller, and uh, Kenneth Jones were the three that were really running the education department. So we sat down and basically explained what it was we wanted to do. Um, they were very much, like, it wasn't like we were trying to adjust to get the cash from them. So. We were very much on the same page, and so at that time they chose to give us, they gave us, it was a half a million is what they gave us, and that was, um, we were the first, one of the f uh, first five high schools in the United States that they gave any money to. And then starting in January of 2001, I really started to put it all together, starting to hire the teachers, starting to put together the, you know, the, basically the inform all of the marketing materials to get the students so that we could open in the fall of 2001. And then he went to the Tacoma School District and said, hey, you're interested. You already had the support. You already had some seed money. You already had uh, a lot of what, you know, anybody who's looking at a business would need to get off the ground. So that's how Soto really got started. Then he contacted people like me and Sonny and other people who we thought, you know, so who are the kind of teachers we'd want at a school like this? When I realized I was going to start the School of the Arts, the first person I went and talked to was Steve Cairns. I'd known Steve for years. I used to change John Kettler's diapers. So I went up and had a conversation with Steve. And actually neither of us were you know, looking desperately for a change. We were pretty happy where we were. But uh, as I, I have said at different occasions, John's pretty persuasive. Um, Steve was going to go to Soda, or at least that's what, you know, he he and John would sort of talk about it. Steve would say to me privately, I, I don't know if I'm really going to leave Floss. I don't, I don't know if this will happen or not. And then when it really started becoming a reality, uh, they had actually someone else in mind for the for the other humanities position, for the history humanities position. 
and uh, they, but that fell through. So they came to me and they said, well, you know, why don't you do it? I went, oh, no, no way. No, 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 no I'm not going to do that because I don't want to do that. That I'd have to work with Steve, you know, I'd have to. Oh, it it just, yeah, it was just like, no, I'm not going to do that. But what was really funny was John, as I'm sure people have mentioned, um, took me out to coffee. And when he took me out to coffee, he said, when are you going to get another chance to start a school? When are you going to get to do something like this? A new experiment, yeah. And, uh, you know, I had to... I had to agree because, uh, as Steve mentioned, you know, it's the kind of thing every teacher dreams about who really cares about what they do. You know, is there a better way to do this than the way we've been doing it? I was actually teaching a Sunday school class and Ralph Harrison was teaching it with me. And then he said, you know, I'm thinking about starting a school. Um, what do you think about this idea? And he gave me the, uh, he gave me the overview and, well, I need a, I need somebody who knows about science. Let's talk some more. Can I, uh, can I buy you a cup of coffee? That's the first time I heard that. Can I buy you a cup of coffee? No, we, we talked. We talked, you know, and, you know, he talked about his concepts and what, he, what he's trying to accomplish with the school and how great it would be to do this and what would you think about that and these are my goals and, and, and I'm kind of going, well, you know, Science in an arts high school doesn't sound like we're going to be doing too much science. And he goes, that's my point. He wants to make sure that the sciences and the math and the humanities are very, very strong um, for the, the, the high school so that um, it's a, um, that's, it was one of his major points to, to, make, those, to make those subjects, non-art subjects, um, as strong as they possibly can be. Uh, Doris, I'd known Doris for years because we'd worked together at Stadium High School. He had said, oh, I have this really great idea, we should like start this art school. And of course, you know, as an art teacher, you're like, okay, that sounds like a great idea. And so, um, so he and I would just, you know, after school we'd have coffee and we'd talk about this, our ideas and stuff. Teresa Chrysler, I'd known Teresa from uh, Stadium High School as well. And so she had a desire to participate and be part of it. And I knew that John was working on some big project and had even asked him that when they got to the point of choosing teachers, I was interested in seeing what the math position would look like, etc. Paul Elliott was doing his student teaching or just finishing it up. I started teaching at Stadium High School as an assistant band director. And I think he was teaching the, either the jazz band or orchestra or something in the morning there. And then we had a staff meeting one day where they announced that John Cutler was going to be leaving his post at Stadium and um, starting to develop this new high school to open in the fall. As soon as we walked out of that staff meeting, I cornered John Cutler and pinned him up against a series of lockers. And then um, <clears throat> I, I said, take me with you. Please, take me with you. This is everything that I've ever wanted to do. So Robin Jakeline was at Grant Elementary School. And so Robin, I... Um, had a conversation with her. And then I got the phone call. And the phone call was John saying, hey Robin, will you come join this group that was getting together and meeting um, fairly frequently. I wanna say I maybe only met every two weeks or so, not every week, um, but more than once a month, um, to talk about building this new art school. And really the workload was crazy because the problem is is that everyone already had a job and this was a new job on top of another job. So everyone would work their job till three or four o'clock in the afternoon and then we would all meet at Tacoma Central Building, fourth floor. We had a little room that was ours and we just went to work every single night trying to figure out how this would work, what it would be. So we were upstairs in cab, they gave us this sort of this floor, up there. I think it was the fourth floor at the time. And um, it wasn't even cubicles, it was sort of like some desks and like Robin was there and Paul Elliott was there. And, John and the Karens were, were there, and so we, and Ralph, Ralph Harrison was there. And Robin was like way pregnant, so it was really <laughs> funny because she was just waddling around. It was, it was fun. We, we actually, we had a lot of fights, but we had a lot of fun too. I, yeah, one of the things I think I was going to mention is just about the school district. You know, they, they, 
on, on the one hand, they wanted to encourage us to think outside the box. But, of course, whenever that happens, on the other hand, anytime we actually did think outside the box, they got really <laughs> nervous. <laughs> so their support was always kind of, you, know, you never knew if you really had them in the end backing you up. But in the end, they, they came through for us. But, but it was a lot of tug of war for a long time. Well, like we, when we go to Wilson and we have all these, the pushback from the high schools like Wilson and Stadium and Foss, they're kind of like, what, what are you doing? Uh, you're doing what? Arts high school? We got art here at this high school, that kind of stuff. And we had a lot of hesitation with the schools and there's a lot of, a lot of thought that we might take their best students away. So there's a little bit of competition. Even though there shouldn't be competition, there is competition. We um, called every single ninth grader in Tacoma Public Schools at home at night and got them on the phone and got their parents on the phone and tried to talk about the school and ask them to apply. And sometimes people were like, I've already gotten the flyer. Don't call me again. This is like the third time you've called. You know what I mean? Like sometimes people were not very happy with us. We were persistent. On Labor Day evening, the day before school started basically, it was teacher meetings the next day and then school, I got a phone call at 9 or 9.30 p.m., which I consider late, from Stephen Sonny Cairns and he continued, uh, proceeded to tell me about soda and how they thought they had a math teacher but that person was unable to come and they need a math teacher i would be perfect but it didn't take much more than a couple hours to know that yes i was supposed to go for it and so the next morning i called sunny and let her know that i was going for it that was the i really felt strongly about interviewing or whatever i needed to do at that point and they said where are you and I, at that time I was in the cafeteria at Stadium High School in the big teachers meeting. And they said, well, Doris Conrath is on her way. She will pick you up, kidnap you, and bring you to Central for your interview. And Doris and I had interacted, but didn't know each other well, but we met up with each other and she brought me to Central and I interviewed with, met the team and interviewed with John and by, I think that was around 8.30 or 10 o'clock in the morning, the day after Labor Day. And by noon, I, then I went back to stadium and basically started packing, although I had to wait for the official word from HR. And by noon, they called and said, yes, you got the job. And by three o'clock, I had everything packed out of stadium and walked out and haven't looked back. One of the things that I remember the most is a meeting about a week or two before school that we had up at Tacoma Central, it was the whole crew, and we realized that no one had thought about tables and chairs. That we didn't, not, not only we did not, we not really have buildings and spaces, but we hadn't even thought about making sure that there was a place to sit inside of them. Um, so a lot of, you know, and then it's quick, let's run to the warehouse and see what we can find that's old and discarded by other schools. Are we gonna get the building? Are we gonna be able to get in there and open up the doors? Can we put some chairs down? You know, and real estate and illegal and those guys were not let, no, you know, you know, and peeking through windows and there's no way we're getting in. And that came about, there was no school building. I mean, they just could not get contract, signature, somebody's on vacation. And that's what it was. Somebody's on vacation and sat on somebody's desk. They got papers from somebody else to get to somebody else. And it wasn't about, it wasn't, you know, just sitting on desks. And that, that's just a process that you have to go through. So we had to go plan B real quick. And somebody, I forget who said it. So as we were talking about, well, where could we go? We realized that, of course, one of the places we could go would be a place that could hold a bunch of people. And so our first day we met right over there by the, um, well, by the Washington State History Museum, kind of in the amphitheater there. We gave everybody orange t-shirts that looked like construction t-shirts that said under construction on them. We um, 
took some pictures and checked everybody in and made sure we had everybody. We had all the buses lined up down there. We got on. And then we went to Camp Sispus, which is kind of up by Packwood, kind of up by White Pass. Camp Sispus. Where do you start? Yeah, Camp Sispus. We've never gone back, and there's a reason for that. Camp Sispus itself, not so good. Sispus was horrible. Mold was kind of the theme, uh, the food. There was moldy bread. Really mealy apples. The milk was sour. I'm not making this up. I mean, it's worse than school lunch, so. I mean, it was the, the experience. But, but that experience brought us, you know, it just gave us the opportunity, gave us three days to kind of create those relationships. Probably spent most of camp with the deer in the headlights look, going, Oh my gosh, what have I done? Because <laughs> you start with, hey, here's your mentor group. Hey, you're doing this, you're doing that. All these terms that they were all familiar with because they had worked together to build it all summer. They've been interviewing kids and all of this. And then there I am. And, but it was, one nice thing is for the first time in my life, a math teacher was appreciated because that was the one missing piece. So everyone was thrilled to have a math teacher, so. It was super fun. We had a really good time. We had campfires and the student body was really small because we only had one class. So we were able to do a lot of the sort of traditional camping things that we don't really do anymore now. And we did a lot of group building within our mentor groups and we played Pictionary. Steve played guitar and other students played guitar. That's where we got our jiggy on with the Steve Cairns was on the frisbee doing the disc. And uh, uh, Paul Elliott may have been providing the percussion at that moment, uh, as well as kind of a drum circle of, of other students. And uh, the beat was established and I just sort of, uh, you know, flowed. Uh, borrowing heavily, I think, from uh, Robert Frost. I um, actually have not told people this, but um, I actually um, kind of had a drum circle. Um, I've grown to hate drum circles, so it's embarrassing to mention that, but um, we had a number of things to try to do to get everyone together, and no one knew each other. We always had these really ridiculous, grandiose plans for things that we should do with the kids, so we were gonna like film them. John had this idea, has lots of them, um, to uh, get just a brief, real quick kind of snapshot interview with everyone. He asked every single kid the same thing. What are you going to be when you grow up? And we got out of like 150 kids, half of them were like, I'm going to be a superstar. And then this is where the, the Doris Conrath habit began. She stayed up all night at camp, editing all that footage together. The next year I thought, that's a that slideshow. <laughs> um, I think that it succeeded in getting everyone to know each other. So that when we came back to kind of school the next week, um, there was already this sense of camaraderie and this like, well, we're all in this together. It's going to be what it's going to be. I mean, when we came back from camp, we came back, the school district at that time hadn't fully signed the lease yet still for 1950. So we came back, we really couldn't occupy or come into the building. So I think. It was one day, maybe it was one and a half days, we literally took in small groups, walked them around the city and kind of went through the University of Washington and here's where some of the classes are going to be. We'd go to the museums and show them that or, you know, so that they'd kind of get some sense of here are the different spaces we're going to be using and we're going to be in. And then, like I say, after that first day and a half or something, then we were able to we came into this space, but like I say, there was nothing in here. It was just raw warehouse space. We were only on the first floor. We didn't have access to the second floor because there was a copy machine company that was still in here, so they occupied the top floor. The, uh, the state of condition that um, this uh, building had sat, the bottom floor had sat unused, um, unused for, I, I would say, years. <laughs> it was. <laughs> It was not suitable for habitation. The whole side that's now all the science classrooms was a big empty warehouse with no power and lights and a big pile of broken concrete in the middle of the floor. Uh, there was a new business, there was another business upstairs. We only had the bottom floor and... Oh, and they must have hated us. Only the, uh, as you're facing, you know, as you're facing the building, only the left-hand side had power. 
there were no power or lights in the right hand side. Yeah, uh, like power, like maybe one or two outlets, maybe. Right. right. So we ran as we began. The, the other thing, too, is it hadn't been swept up. Without exaggerating, there was probably an inch of dust and concrete debris and stuff like that over every inch of the floor. So, welcome to your new school, students. Except that it looks like crap. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know? and it had big old machines that were oh, yeah. sitting there, obsolete machines. It had random tools laying around. It had cartons of of leftover fast food that workers had left behind. It had, um, it had, oh, I liked this. It had all kinds of plants like growing on the inside of the windows because they'd they, kind of gotten through the, they'd kind of yeah. gotten through and they like, they were like growing inside the windows. It was bizarre. It was the strangest place ever to have a school. But it was a definitely a new frontier. And the floor was concrete and there were big wooden posts, but there were no walls. So it was pretty large, but it was also really dirty and really cold. There was electricity, but no lights. So I had to go and um, buy shop lights. And I still have up there, I didn't take them down, the uh, floodlights that we mounted on those big posts, cool posts. I left a couple floodlights because we had electrical um, cords daisy chained all the way up and down hanging with these uh, electrical light and tried to create a humanities classroom the humanities classroom was like half the school at a time so it's like 60 kids in this huge room with a bunch of thrown away junk tables um, one overhead projector like an old school overhead projector and a bunch of shop lights <laughs> dust everywhere, um, but Steve and Sonny Karen's made that work, I'll tell you. And so actually went and bought canvas and just hung big sheets of canvas to kind of visually divide the space. There was no heat, so we had a, a couple of sort of physical facility problems. We had to clean it up before we could use it, I guess is what it really amounts to. Cleaning and cleaning and cleaning and clean. We did some of it ourselves. I mean, Ralph is a maniac, right? I mean, he just would go crazy. Yeah. Uh, he's He was insane. Then there was the workman who literally worked around us. At one point, I was teaching with a ditch running, an open ditch, which I'm not sure how we got away with this, but an open ditch is they were putting in the plumbing and stuff in the floor and you kind of had to hop over it to get to the whiteboard and then you hop back over it to get to the students. I remember, for instance, just teaching, I, and again, there were fewer enough students back then that I might have had a third of the kids in the room and I'm doing some humanities lesson. Uh, I'd leaned a piece of whiteboard material, not, not actually not actually a whiteboard. framed or anything, just stuff I'd bought at yeah. Home Depot against the wall and we were using that for a whiteboard. We had nothing else to write on, of course. And, um, but, but I'm doing all this and I'm kind of finally really getting into the lesson and the kids are pretty much with me. And then guess what? The truck pulls up in front of 1950 and here you know, we were sitting on student folding chairs. The stools had arrived. So guess what? Well, for the next hour and a half, we're not, you know, school's out and we're all, the kids are all helping unload furniture. So I started school with no, with all these students ready to learn photography and we had no cameras. And then, um, then it got better, like it, it got way better. So uh, we got the cameras, but I only had one laptop, some old laptop of John. So I ran this whole program on these digital cameras that were really bad, because back then digital cameras weren't very good. So we had that and this one laptop. So we sort of did class. But there was no walls and no structure. So particularly for musicians, it's really hard to not be able to make much noise. And uh, then we eventually shifted and we got ourselves a classroom at uh, UW Tacoma. And still, we couldn't play guitars or play trumpets in the middle of a UW Tacoma classroom. I was fed up. I went to uh, our principal, Joan James, and I said, look, if we can't solve this, like I'm out, I'm out. It's been two months. I don't know what to teach anymore. I'm gonna start playing movies. We were fortunate that the building across the street from us on the other side, so it would have been south of 21st Street, it was just 
their um, individual had purchased it. He had also purchased and the fun, um, melting pot had just gone in down there. The problem was is there's no movement of people really in the city. So they were pretty excited. They gave us a really good deal on that lower space. It was just raw space. The space was vast. The space was open. There was room for everybody to work on stuff. And I'm a big project person, so I like to get people in groups and work on projects and then bring it all together for big productions and big shows. So for me, you could spread out everywhere. You could bring a boom box. Everybody kind of could find their own place. I had half the space. And, and through these giant, heavy, enormous doors that supposedly slid open, you could go over to Paul Elliott's half and the instrumental music was there. It was, uh, it was awesome. <laughs> it was so great. Um, we, I had about 5,000 square feet of space just for music. Uh, we were able to set up a computer lab with um, Acid Pro software. Um, we were able to have rehearsals with instruments and make noise. Um, there was a dance space where Robin could start having dance class. Um, it just, um, it, well, it more than like tripled the amount of space that we had the month before. So it changed everything really. And we were now able to actually start to build a kind of curriculum and actually start to, it felt like we were actually getting going now. So it's early in the morning. You may have big recollections where, you know, everybody in my generation is knowing where they were and when they were, when, when they heard Kennedy was assassinated. Your generation's going to know exactly where you were when you heard about 9-11. Yes, we began the school in September of 2001. And on September 11th, 2001, there were planes running into buildings back east. Um, I was good friends with the security guards at the Washington State History Museum and, um, and I was walking um, on the sidewalk um, early one morning and uh, they like to come out and have their smoke on the sidewalk and we always struck up a conversation. Well, that one morning um, um, I, was, I was walking and it might have been, you know, like in between a class or something and one of them was out there and he's just kind of really upset and he's listening to his radio, you know. And, um, and I go, what's up? And he goes, man, they just bombed. You know, they, they, they did, blew up the trade centers. I go, what? And I heard about it on the bus. And of course, the bus route goes right past Fort Lewis, and, which was on major, major lockdown that day and for the weeks following that. So it took forever to get here on the bus. So I was late coming to work. It was about. It was like a two and a half hour bus ride. It was just an I-5 around the uh, Air Force Base and, the, and, and Fort Lewis was just shut down. I was, when I first found out about it, I was in my truck. I was driving between here and Central School and taking care of, I don't know what it was, and I heard it on the radio. And then um, as the news kept going and it was described, so I, I heard it described on my way, like live, on my way to school that morning. And so, um, but really for the first 10 minutes, it didn't register as what, it, what was going on. Like you, you hear it and we don't really register. And then by the time I got to school, the whole, like I completely, the whole thing had happened. And um, so it was really, but you know, I think that the school district's policy was that it would be more normal for students to be in school than to, to not be in school, especially since we were so far away from the whole thing. And so we were in school the whole day. By the second plane, you realize that this is not an accident. This is weird. And uh, what I, what was very meaningful to me was as the stories, and then we heard about the plane that went down into the field in Pennsylvania, where some brave people who realized they were going to die anyway decided they were not going to let their plane be a guided missile, and they. They took the suicide run into the earth rather than aim toward another high population area. Uh, and again, the difference between, I mean, it's all sorts of lessons I've taken from that over the years as a humanities teacher. The difference between those passengers on the first plane and the passengers on the second plane was nothing but information. The cell phones, 
they, they began to put the pieces together. They were going to be a guided missile and people would die. And, and they made that, that very difficult and, and valiant decision to, uh, to go down and, and let that be the end of that, that disruption. Uh, but, but immediately as we're hearing, as the pieces are falling together, the reaction among the students was probably, uh, you know, typical of the reaction of the citizens all over the, all over our country for sure. In the sense that hmm. you'd watch one student, you know, just completely shaken and 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 starting, it's it's sinking in and they're starting to cry. Another guy, let's as it happened, uh, stood up and says, "Well, we got to get him. We got to get him. Find out who's responsible. And, you know, get him." And so yeah. one of the things was that, you know, as a school, we knew we needed a response. And that's where, um, where we, you know, sort of came together and found something to give that meaning. And then very quickly after that, John had a really great idea. That was yet another one that helped bring the school together. Um, and it was to create these uh, life-size, two-dimensional, cutouts, like they cut out of plywood. Of people, and then they had questions on them, and they were basically painted so they looked like chalkboards. And then it had a question on them, and then we placed them around the University of Washington campus and up and down Pacific Avenue. So then people could write their feelings on it, and they had chalk attached to them. And so it was kind of a way for people to express their feelings about what was going on, and about war, and you know, peace, or about terrorism, and you know, what had happened and how we'd been attacked. I believe it was a week after that there was a memorial service at noon. Um, we walked our entire school, and I remember the walk. I remember how poignant and emotional it was for every single SOTA staff member and student to walk across Pacific Avenue all the way down Dock Street to where there was a memorial, like speaker and service and that's where this service was held. And I just remember we all gathered there with the downtown community there were, and had a moment of silence for all of those who had passed and who were injured. And I remember sitting there with students and just kind of spontaneously, a group started singing Amazing Grace and just sitting there holding each other and thinking about what had happened and so in that way comforting I guess one another and just being together. People crying and people there were students who maybe not their direct immediate family I don't think we had to my knowledge I don't think we had any immediate families but we had uncle or cousin or do you know what I mean my cousin's wife or things like that where um, they knew someone like somehow directly related to someone. And, um, you know, off of coming off of camp, which is we're all new to this thing, we don't know what we're doing, but we're gonna make it happen and, and creating this sort of closeness at camp to come back and do this. It, I think 9-11 brought us together more than camp did even, because it really put a, I don't know, it put a base for us. It, was a, it really grounded us all, and it was really important for us as a school for everybody to walk down there and go to that service together and kind of just be together and take the time to sort of experience that. Anytime you're struggling to keep kids coming to school and still buying into your dream, uh, when something keeps them at home for a couple days, they start thinking again uh, about their old friends and their old school and everything like that. So we were kind of losing kids by the day already, but 9-11 definitely took another chunk. And it was like, do I really want my kids in this downtown setting and safety? So there was that part of it. There were other parts of it that I think that, you know, this is just what you think about as a teacher. You have to teach to every kid. You have to teach to the low kid, the average kid, and the high kid. And how do you deliver curriculum to all of those? Well, I feel like as a school that first semester, we did pretty good with the average and the low, but the kids that were high that were coming to us were going, what are you delivering to me? You think about it, anybody who um, was starting a school, they, they have their own expectations, they had their own ideas of what the school um, was going to be like, um, but they didn't really think about the first, the first days or the, you know, the startup of this and that. So 
Most people didn't equate that any of that into their formula of what soda was going to be. I think that I think John summed it up really well in a conversation that we had during those first few months. He said, "It's from Monday through Friday, it's great. Like when they're here and we're engaged and we're doing stuff, they sort of forget about what life used to be like." But then they go home on the weekends and they see their old friends and they talk about what the other schools are like and then they, they grow homesick for that secure reality, of the, you know, the security of what they, know, what they know. Because it was unorganized and we'd already changed like the partnering, like, you know, the collaboration classes mid-semester we realized they weren't working, we ditched them, we're offering these new Friday things and we're going to see how that goes. And you can preach flexibility all you want and in the reality, it's awesome. But there were, I think, a number of students who had a hard time buying in or having the willpower or constitution to ride it out. Um, and so we did have people who, who were leaving. And quite frankly, I think staff were burned out. I think we also are going through all of this, our schedules changing and working many, many hours. And it wasn't just deciding what you were going to teach the next day, which we had no curriculum and that's what we were doing on a daily basis. What am I going to do tomorrow? What am I going to do tomorrow? What am I going to do tomorrow? We were also still trying to build the systems of the school. So many of us were staying very late at night and coming in on weekends and going, I have to create the next system or stabilize it in some way. And so that became very hard and tedious as a staff. And we were just getting tired. More than a do half a dozen times. There were issues, they were just there, issues in the community uh, that we had to deal with. And in all complete sincerity, there were, there were few enough of us, teachers and students, and butterscotch came in handy this way. I remember more than once, you know, it's nine in the morning and something's come up, it's an issue we really, it's the elephant in the room, you know, you gotta deal with this. Um, and we basically stopped classes. We called kind of an impromptu town, town, like town meeting. meeting type yeah. Thing. And, and we'd all huddle together. And, and and again, it wasn't so much a matter of, okay, you guys better straighten up because. It was, hey, we, our community, we've got a problem. This this is an issue we, we can't afford not to deal with. And in fact, the sooner, you know, let's, let's deal with it while it's still a small problem before it gets to be uh, a killer problem. And so, you know, every once in a while, maybe, you know, every month or two, Something like that in those early days would come up and we literally would pull the plug and huddle as, as a group uh, to see how we could as a community solve that issue. I think all in all we would have try to figure out how to get the students to really be engaged and really like take charge of their own learning and then that's how they stayed. It kind of got down to its core and things had begun rolling and we started having some successes so everyone was starting to, you know, it started with this ideal and then it got crashed by reality and we were getting back to um, what it could be and what we could do. So um, we really had to hit a home run with mini term. Well, I don't exactly remember when we decided that we were going to take a week and stop classes and do a project. Um, I know it must have been, well, who knows? It could have been the day before. <laughs> um, but um, we didn't call it mini term. We didn't really think of it quite yet the way that we now think of mini term or J term at college. Um, we, I think we just figured out that there was this opportunity and we could do that because of the, our, our control over our schedule. But um, we decided that we were going to do an all school project together and produce something. The students wrote, directed, produced, created the costumes, created the everything for a production called The Frog Princess. And we all bought in on it really quick and figured out how we could divvy up ourselves and divvy up kids so that there were all the phases of a production happening. There was people writing, there was people creating and rehearsing music, there was people creating and rehearsing choreography, there were visual arts and sets and costumes, um, that we could divvy the whole school up and work together on a project. And um, of course mine was building, or you know, getting things done. 
So I had my uh, crash crew and my, um, um, you know, we had to figure out how to get these sets put together and and um, get material, you know, find it, borrow it, steal it. We came to school on Monday morning, immediately divvied up. Um, we knew that we had the Rialto booked for a Friday evening, that Friday evening, five days from now, um, and that we needed to have a show, and it was going to be the first big thing that anyone came to see from Soda. So we had high expectations, and we were really excited to push kids as far as we could. Um, but it was crazy production to do in five days. We were getting, you know, rewrites from the writing department. Um, we've added a scene. And I'm like, we need new music for a scene. You know? So we had people writing music. We were ripping music off the store shelves and, and rearranging it um, because it was a pretty weird ensemble of musicians, you know, like one tuba, three violins, a guitar, you know, <laughs> all this kind of stuff. Um, so we were adapting music. And then people would come back and go, nope, 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 we cut that scene. It's now been transformed into this scene, and there's, here's a new script. So we were getting new scripts and re-edits like all through the day. I just got organized, and so I came in and taught a, a very traditional circle dance, like a Russian circle dance that um, I learned myself like off a of video, and then I taught it to the dancers, so it was like simple and repetitive and clean and I had the music for it and and I directed it and so they could wrap their heads around it and do it and do it well. And then for the rest of the parts of Frog Princess I really divided all the kids into groups so they all had something else they were working on besides this group dance and they had to create those parts. So I remember we had a section of like fire dance and I had somebody trying to do like what, do, what does fire look like and um, we had something that had to do with blue and ocean because I remember we had all this blue material and ocean material on the stage. And then obviously theater was more the lead for it. And um, I just remember our son of course was one of the players and well, I don't know what was he in the Frog Princess? I don't remember. I, I, really don't, don't. I don't know either. But Maybe anyway, the princess, huh? yeah he was probably the princess. Two students who were working together with the art and working on a panel and they are, were two students who were just very, very different. And in a normal world, in a normal high school, their paths never would have crossed, except maybe at lunch. And they probably would have bumped into each other and who knows what would have happened at that point. Um, but they ended up working together and even they were amazed that it's like, oh my gosh, if this opportunity hadn't been here, I never would have gotten to know you and to know that I like you and I like hanging out with you. And they became maybe not best, best friends, but they became friends. But, you know, it was just, it was kind of a unifying thing that we did together. Um, it was exciting to kind of try to put it together and put it on. I was more, you know, involved in, putting the posters together so that we could advertise it and helping with that so that we'd get good attendance. And I mean, we had it at the Rialto and it was sold out that night. So, I mean, I mean, it was packed. It was really cool. <laughs> it was really awesome. Um, a whole ton of people came to the show that night. I mean, a lot, like five, 700 people came to the show that night and it went really well. I may be jaded in my memory that I, I think it was super awesome. I'm sure there was probably things that didn't go really well, but it was, I think, really visually stunning from the visual arts department and the um, set work that they'd done um, to the costuming and the dance and the materials. Um, the orchestra was up in the, uh, like in the balcony at the Rialto. Um, I was trying to conduct and look back behind me the whole time. I just think it's one of the first things that we did that was the project that we work towards and that the collaboration of that is what made it so strong. And I had actually had a dance concert prior to that, but not in a theater. And I think putting it in a professional theater helped, you know, polish that, make it worthwhile. I, I will say that um, it was one of those experiences where we pulled it off. I think yeah. everybody felt yeah. great about what was really quite a, a large accomplishment for a group of, you know, ragtag group of two students and teachers. 
it reminds me all the time that project-based education works when everyone's working toward a common goal. It, it, you know, but the, the point is, it was over, everybody felt wonderful about it, and everybody kind of agreed that we'd never quite pull it off that way again. It was definitely palpable that coming back after that experience, that the kids were bought in a whole lot more. And we had restructured classes and we're about to begin second semester, and so, you know, things were, things were really beginning to click at this point. We weren't losing kids anymore. It was new, it was refreshing, it brought us all together. It was good and it was positive. And um, it just sort of reminded of us of, we get caught up in all the systems, but why are we here? And the arts part of it became the focus for that mini term. Not that there wasn't a whole bunch of other things involved, but that became why we were here. And it kind of brought it all back up. After uh, our mini term, we came back with uh, a renewed sense of the possibilities that our school could be. Once we came back from the Frog Princess, um, I felt like the school was unified the most that it ever had been. Um, we'd been in our new schedule since October. We, we kind of had a rhythm going, so curriculum was moving along. Um, we had testing later that year, and it went really well. And then the second semester, we decided we were going to do darkroom. So John sort of put walls up and we built a dark room, but we had no running water. So we just took um, an old stainless steel kitchen sink and put it between two tables so that, and then we put five gallon buckets underneath it. And so when people process their film, the liquid would go into the sink, down the drain into a five gallon bucket. And then one of my students had to take the bucket and into the hallway and dump it in the janitors. So that had to be, like that was someone's job, was to be sort of the drain every day. All kinds of people would just come in off the streets <laughs> while we were teaching. And so you'd be in the middle of teaching and really serious good things are going on and someone would walk in off the street and okay, they would either one, maybe they were a street person and they didn't know what they were doing and they were completely out of it and they were drunk, or they would come in off the street and say, do you know where the history museum is? Or they'd, I mean, it went on and on and on. And in that first year, I actually taught down in the history museum, that, that, that space that's a cafe. And Okay, so everybody thought, oh, this is great. Look at Sunny. She has this fabulous classroom. And there's a bagel shop. Oh, there, right? yeah, the bagel. I don't know what's there, but you know, it's a coffee shop. It's that little thing that looks like a larger than an outhouse, it sits in front of the history. Yeah, museum. yeah, that, I'm sure they know which one it is. Anyway, it was this space that everybody thought, oh, wow, well, yeah, now Sunny has that space. You know, it's really cool. And the, but then they didn't teach it. We became a little dysfunctional sometimes and uh, didn't always get along and we would go do retreats. We've, we've done a retreat out on Vashon Island. We'd have all these little retreats and at one point we had to have somebody come in and like coach us. We had to have a staff coach because we were just like fighting and at one of those times there was like the harmony bowl and he would rub it home and Ralph Harrison, oh. And um, as he's instructing us, you know, um, how to get in touch with our feelings and how to express ourselves um, with each other. And it was okay to bring up problems and it's okay to, you know, express your discontent but two together with, so we went through a few stages, a few sessions of that. And the retreat at the, at the retreat at Vashon, we would always want to talk over each other. Like we, no, nobody could keep their mouth shut and not talk. And so we had to have a duck and you could only talk if you had the duck. So it'd be like, pass the duck. And then we could talk if we had the duck. Yeah, we're not always like, we're really good friends, but we're not always like functioning good. We, we can get a little dysfunctional, our little family. And then in the spring, the different departments like you know, your instrumental music and your choir, they decided to have uh, concerts. For me personally, I had had what I would describe as an abject 
failure with the vocal music kids uh, during the first semester. I was way out of my league. I, we couldn't even do the simplest songs. They hated it, I hated it, everyone hated it. Um, so I took a gamble in second semester and I decided, well, if we can't sing It's My Party and I Cry If I Want To, then maybe what we should do is real literature like Gabriel Fauré's Requiem. And we should do a whole Requiem Mass and rent a church and hire an organist and play with a full symphony orchestra and a, our choir. So we can't sing It's My Party, but let's do Fauré's Requiem, right? Um, we hired an accompanist to come in and do rehearsals every day at the piano. I conducted the kids. This gave them something. I had been giving them a low bar and they were well, I think, offended. And so they didn't even try to hit it. But when I gave them an insanely high bar, they reached for it. And uh, it was incredibly successful. Um, I worked with um, people that I knew at Stadium and their orchestra came and played. And it was supplemented by my like 15 players. Um, and a choir of about 45 sophomores with soloists. Um, one of whom's a city council member now, uh, um, with soloists and a hired organist from PLU and a couple days of rehearsal in the venue, and it was awesome. Um, a bunch of people came, it sounded really good, and we recorded it, um, made big posters, made a big deal about it. And so we closed out that year just kind of on cloud nine. It was a show called Blinded Me With Science. And so my theme for all of my classes had something to do with science. Ralph Harrison was my model, and I put him in like his white lab coat and his googly eye glasses, and we took his picture, and he became the poster child for the concert. And we had it at the Rialto, and it was awesome. Like it just, again, same thing as Frog Princess. It, we worked all semester to produce this really great concert um, that was of high quality dancing and varied choreography and creative and really got and every single class performed from beginning to advanced and um, all those levels coming together at the Rialto to do this show and it was the first really big production and we had a lot of people there and it was just really satisfying to realize that the deliverable of the curriculum was all going in the right direction. And I know Paul hate me for sharing this story because He's sick of me until I sang it to him, but um, he obviously had a concert where he had his, his band instruments, you know, or, you know, students perform. And when you have 170 students and there's like one trumpet player, there's somebody who decides they want to play tuba, but they've never really played before. And then you got three stringed instruments and a harp and something else. I mean, you know, he had to kind of rewrite things so that there was some kind of, you know, it made somewhat sense, and I mean, based on the way I'm explaining it, that's about how it sounded. So we had, uh, and after the concert was over, I just, obviously I couldn't go say anything to him, but I did. A few weeks later, I sat down and just said, you know, our name does say Tacoma School of the Arts, and since it does, it'd just be, if that's how we're gonna sound, we should just not have a concert, so. But yeah, they have never been, anything close to that since and it's gone on to, I mean, it's just, we got incredible musicians that, and Paul has built it into a really incredible department, so. Well, I will say that the first year or two of Soda in particular was really hard on everyone and their family and their marriages. <laughs> Nobody, like everyone's husbands and wives hated us, hated our school, hated what we were doing to their family because it was really all consuming. It was all consuming in the hours, but it was also all consuming in the like attitude. I mean, this is like a major business startup. It consumes your every waking moment and thought. Um, and I think a lot of us went overboard with it and it was a real struggle to kind of find some more balance between our personal lives and our professional lives and you know, get it all together. But I think that happens with a lot of startup businesses and things like that too, but it was, it was really rough. It was long days, 14, 16 hour days, you know, every day, six days, seven days a week, you know, and it still continues to be very, very long days, you know, because, you know, I believe in the work, I believe that it's, you know, it's worth doing, but that is one of the tolls it takes on, you know, your 
personal life, fun, you know, as a person, because you do spend a lot of time doing it. The real strength of the program was the relationships that yeah. we had yeah. with, with the students. I got to be in Robin's class. I got to be in theater with Susie. And the best way I know to work with kids or to support is to participate. And so I was able to participate and take dance from Robin Jake line with the kids. And I participated in the theater activities as much as possible. I could have sat in a corner and just watched and intervened, but I chose to participate. And I remember you know, I would struggle. I have, I don't see myself as a mover or a dancer, but I tried hard and I tried to do everything that Robin had us do and I'd participate in all the activities. It was before the bad knees. And I remember walking back down here because uh, that was at the Broadway Center for the Performing Arts in the rehearsal hall. And I remember walking back down here and a student practically bowled me over, giving me a hug and said, TC, TC, I just want you to know that I don't like math. I don't know if I ever will, but because you're willing to take risks in dance class, I'm going to give you my best effort in math class. And that's when I think I really knew, well, I knew before, but that really, was one, of, was one of those moments, and I know Steve or Sonny or Michelle would have a big word for it, but just one of those defining moments of this is what it's about, about not being afraid to risk and to take risks and for the students to know that it's a risk for us too. This isn't a safe thing that we're doing in any way, shape, or form. Soda's not an easy place to work with, work at, just in terms of, it takes a lot of work to work here. It's not a slide through job. You have to be on your game, you have to be good at your game, you have to build relationships, you always gotta be out there doing something new. And the, the greatest thing is working with collaborative teachers, particularly for me, because I'm in the arts, collaborative artists who have the same idea of quality work that I have and and want to be inventive like I do. And of course, you know, by the time the kids who did stay that year, by the time they graduated, you know, they are people for whom I, I will, I, I just won't ever forget them. I won't ever forget their names. While they probably lost out on some seat time in classrooms, they like built a school. You know, they were here when the dark room was being built and they were here when things were being uncreated and so in a lot of ways they built studios the way an artist might build a studio and so um, I think what they what they didn't get they also gained on all these other levels and they were really these these pioneering um, souls that sort of got the school started. It was a it was an, an interesting class that class was it really was there'll never be another class like it the collection of uh, of kids, the, um, the spectrum of kids that we had. We had the real brilliant, um, um, you know, you call them scholars, and then you had the really garage band crazy, you know, no hold bar, let's get down and play music. Yeah, that's all I want to do is play music. Ah. And, uh, and uh, our, my eyes were wide open. Well, wow. I think if you started everything at the beginning and it all went smoothly, you wouldn't have had the opportunity to really grow that kind of camaraderie between the staff and the students. Actually, there's some recent literature coming up. It's, it, it's always seemed obvious to, to some of us, but you know, the point that failure is as important as success. And you know we faced some specific failures during those first that first year or so Lots that we as a community had to okay so now what do we do? We had to figure out a way to get through the yeah to, to make something better of it. You know, if you kind of have a vision for something, if you have the ability to articulate it, 
and then you know you can kind of put that down i think the most important thing though is to look for people that are a lot smarter than you are and to be able to pull teams of people together and to be able to work together collaboratively to actually realize it can it's the ability to move forward and try new things and know that in the end it's either not going to work and you're going to learn a whole lot from it or it's going to work really great and you're going to learn a whole lot from it but that either way you need to like let life happen and make decisions to the best of your knowledge with in information that you have and go out there and try something and i i feel like from working at soda i can do that i can let a lot of stuff go and try to really focus on the heart of what's the most important thing. And I really feel like that's why soda's good, is it keeps coming back to the heart of what is the most important thing. And it lets the other stuff go. We're not gonna try to do it all, but let's do this stuff really good. I was really pretty much never bored teaching at soda because there was always the next thing. There was always something new to do and someone, you know, someone to do it with. And for the most part, with the exception of an occasional bad day, I never felt alone. I always felt like I was in it with a bunch of other people. I think I told you earlier, I had a hard time deciding in 2003 whether I was gonna come here full time or not. Um, that was a very, 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 very hard decision for me because I loved who I worked with at my other job and um, I'd gotten to know people here and I loved them just as much. But that job was safe and my kids were gonna go to elementary school and I got off earlier from work and all of these convenient things. But it wasn't soda, it wasn't soda. I am very glad that I came to soda, that I've had the experiences. It has pushed me to do things to look at education differently and what education can be and should be. I, I have to, you know, I can tell you, I can think of moments in any given day that, you know, this is worth doing. Something was affirmed. Uh, it could be just the the light in a kid's eye when they finally get it. <laughs> you know, that little light bulb that goes on, or it could be. Um, you know, the, the, the talk with a colleague where we, we work out some minor uh, problems and reaffirm each other and move on. So I have the best job in the world. I have, like, the coolest music teacher job ever. Um, I'm the envy of most of my peers. I would be a fool to leave this job. And it was really great. It was great working with that for anybody who would apply to a school that didn't exist before has a certain kind of personality. And so working with that first group of students was um, uh, really a pleasure. The arts had to be the highest caliber of instruction possible and, and build on to that to the next level. It wasn't, gonna, it wasn't going to accept second best or, you know, you know, um, what do you call it, craft kind of things. He wanted the kids, you know, and that was his passion. He wanted the arts to be real art, you know, and, 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 and taught by masters and, and people who had the same, you know, gone us, the same desire that, you know, that some of the great artists, you know, they're so passionate, they're sitting there painting, you know, they're unkept and, but they're, you know, Michelangelo, they're, uh, you know, you know what I mean? The passion that exuded. And that's to this day. You, the art teachers um, do the same thing, so. But that's the way we had to have for science and math, too. We had to have science as strong, and that's where I came in. <laughs> I mean, I, for, I had so many moments when I forgot that I was getting paid, that it, that this was a job. It was, there were so many times when it was just my life. It was the relationships that I had. It, these were my people. I was doing something important and meaningful. And there were more days at Soda 
in teaching, I can honestly say there were more days without any BS than any other job I've ever had. I would do it again in a heartbeat.